Since I started preaching here last August, I've been doing a sermon series on the seven Unitarian Universalist principles, and today we're on the last one. The last UU principle says that we agree to affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. This last uh, principle was added to the formerly six principles with um, three votes of all the Unitarian Universalists that were at our annual meeting called the General Assembly. Surprisingly, to no one, it caused controversy. <laughs> but it did pass. And it's become one of the principles that is the biggest call to action for Unitarian Universalists as we, as we strive to be responsible as a part of the interdependent web of all existence by making our sanctuaries greener, making our carbon footprint smaller, making our homes greener, our whole lifestyles um, fit more with a sense of feeling responsible as a part of the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. There's a wonderful passage in Hindu scriptures that describes a net that um, stretches throughout the whole universe, and at each juncture in the net there is a bead, and in each bead is reflected the whole universe. I've tried to put a picture of this on the front of your bulletin. It's called Indra's Net, and I want to read you the passage. Far away in the heavenly abode of the great god Indra, there's a wonderful net which stretches out indefinitely in all directions. In accordance with the extravagant tastes of deities, the artificer has hung a single glittering jewel at the net's every node. And since the net itself is infinite in dimension, the jewels are infinite in number. There hang the jewels gl glittering like stars of the first magnitude, a wonderful sight to behold. If we now arbitrarily select one of these jewels for inspection and look closely at it, we will discover that in the polished surface there are reflected all the other jewels in the net, infinite in number. Not only that, but each of the jewels reflected in this one jewel is also reflecting all the other jewels, so the process of reflection is infinite. We are called to act as if we are all part of this net, this web, this infinite reflection where the whole is in each part. Mystics of every religion say that we're all connected, that we are one, and that what affects one part of the net affects us all. Next Sunday, the worship service is going to be a very unusual celebration of the earth called the Gaia Psalms, and it's going to be very meditative. There's music and litany that's spoken over the music, and the children have been making masks. I hope some of the adults have been making masks too because you're encouraged to come dressed as a fish, a bird, a tree, a rock, a cat, an owl, whatever you would like to come dressed as, and nothing if you don't care to. Not in nothing. <sighs> I swear you all. <laughs> so as we walk as uh, folks who are respectful of this web, it affects us in different ways, and some people decide to study a uh, journey with food like you guys did last spring. Some people decide to swear off styrofoam. Other people decide to recycle in their homes. Um, some people uh, decide not to eat any meat at all. I've got a friend um, named Ben in, in San Francisco, and what he does is he doesn't eat any meat or any products from any animals, so he's a vegan. And... Um, he doesn't wear any leather clothes, 
and he rides his bicycle everywhere. And I would really admire his lifestyle more if he were less kind of mean and self-righteous about it. <laughs> but even Ben has to live with the insects being killed so the cotton crop can come in, so his clothes can be made. And so the cherry trees can grow, and the soybeans that make the tofu, you have to kill insects in order to make all that stuff um, grow correctly. Killing seems to be part of eating. And uh, we have to live with that. So I'm going to talk about a guy named Jeffrey Lockwood, who is a professor of entomology at the University of Wyoming. He's a Unitarian Universalist. And his job is to get as many grasshoppers off the grasslands as possible so they don't eat all the grass, so the cattle will have grass to eat. And yet, he's a Unitarian Universalist. He's got these values and he's got this sense of connection with everything. And so, how do you do that? And he's written a book of essays in a beautiful little book called Grasshopper Dreaming, which is subtitled Reflections on Loving and Killing because that's what he's got to do. He, he grew up and was trained with uh, the entomologists who would go get some grasshoppers and bring them to the lab and spray something on them, and if they died, that was a, a successful experiment. But what he decided to do with his students was go observe the grasshoppers. He just wanted to go be with the grasshoppers and watch what they did. So he and his students took video of these grasshoppers over a whole summer. So there were hundreds of hours of video that they watched for the next year. And what they observed was um, changed the way that they uh, tried to control the grasshopper population in the grasslands. What they found out was that the grasshoppers spent an immense amount of time doing nothing. <laughs> now, it's natural for us humans to observe and interpret behavior of animals, insects, whatever, in a very anthropomorphic way. We use our human filters to look. And so the people who were studying grasshoppers were busy people. And so they looked and they were like, those grasshoppers are busy. They're, um, they're sitting in the sun to warm themselves. And then they move to the shade to cool themselves down. <laughs> As it turned out, that's not really true. They were just doing nothing. Lockwood writes that if you use a human filter to look at the grasshoppers, um, you would think that they would be battling for resources because they have a very high mortality rate. Two percent of them every day die. And so they only spend three minutes of every hour eating, and they don't seem to be very interested in reproduction. So um, he said if humans died at a rate of 2% a day, he would imagine that they would be um, scurrying around, attempting to vanquish competitors, hoard supplies, mate feverishly, and, well, do what we kind of always do every day. But grasshoppers aren't humans, he said. The, the idea of competition for survival is an assumption that is inherent in ecology and evolution because of how we've been taught that humans evolved because apparently the people who simplified and presented Darwin's work to us um, really jumped up and down hard on the survival of the fittest bit and didn't talk about uh, the, 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 the um, collaboration and cooperation that he talks about pretty often in the book. So we think of evolution as being a, an embattling kind of predatory process and um, that animals are always struggling for survival, but it turns out these grasshoppers really aren't, and he doesn't know what they're doing all day except for nothing. Maybe they're praying for world peace, I don't know. <laughs> 
But when a scientist is allowed to slow down, when a scientist is allowed to collaborate with other minds who see things differently, when the younger scientists come along and they've grown up in a different milieu, with a different culture, different assumptions from the older scientists, you know, this is the circle of life, new minds come to the same old problems and you see them different ways, everybody knows about the... Um, Museums of natural history that had to completely redo their uh, lion exhibits when, um, you know, in the 50s and 60s when they put these stuffed lion tableaus together, the guys who were studying the lions just kind of said, well, I go out to, well, I'm not even sure they thought it through this much. I go bring home the bacon and my wife stays at home. And so they had the male lions out hunting and the female lions staying back under the tree with the kids. And when they, um, you know, the lion, the cubs, and when um, they actually went to the field and started observing and living with the lions and taking the risk of hanging out with the lions, they found out it was the female lions that went and did the hunting and brought the, the food back to the family. And so they had to like unstuff everything and restuff it so that it could... <laughs> So the female lionesses could be out. We can't, we can't not have blind spots. We're, we all have them. And, and you're blind to them. You're blind to your own blind spots. So you can't say, I'm just not going to have any blind spots. I am a completely uh, pure observer. There is a, a story about a, a structure in Crete that archaeologists were speculating about. It's a little room. Uh, in the middle of the room is a table. At the end of the table are runnels as if to capture liquid. And there's an observation hole in there. Um, and archaeologists up until the 70s, were saying this looks like a chamber of sacrifice, that you, you go in, you have a sacrifice there, and uh, the priest observes to make sure it's done correctly by the other priest, and um, that's what it's for. And then more and more women began to go into the field and get their PhDs in archaeology, and they took a look at the same structure, just with a more female way of looking at the world with female experiences, um, behind them, not that the men were wrong, it's just you have different experiences. And the women said, you know, it looks to us like a birthing chamber. Looks like somebody's going in there, going to be helped, have a baby. The, the, the dad or her mother is looking through the, the observation. I don't know who'd be looking. And um, then, then you can clean it out pretty easily and uh, ready for the next mom. Nobody knows for sure. Sacrifice, birth, who knows? But it's interesting to have other people's perspective on it, and it's uh, always smart to be open to a new way of looking at it. So um, one of the most interesting writers that talks about our blind spots is a guy named Michael Pollan. Many of you know him. He wrote a book called The Botany of Desire, uh, subtitled A Plant's Eye View of the World. And he talks about the history of agriculture. And he says, isn't it just like us humans to imagine that we're the highest species and that we're in charge of everything? And that anything that happens is because we made it happen. He said, but, you know, so we tell ourselves that we domesticated animals. But doesn't it make just as much sense to think that domestication was something animals did to us? So they got to hang out and get fed regularly, <laughs> protected with fences that they couldn't build because they don't have opposable thumbs. And so they could be safer and have a good life. He said, one way of describing the introduction of agriculture 10,000 years ago is that some plants refined their basic put the animals to work strategy, you know, by sticking to their coats, to take advantage of one particular animal that had evolved not only to move freely around the earth, but to think and trade complicated thoughts. These plants hit on a remarkably clever strategy, getting us to move and think for them. And then came edible grasses. They were like, I know, we'll be good to eat. 
wheat. And so the human beings want to plant you. You get your DNA spread all over the place. They trade you with other tribes. They go, here, eat this. This makes bread. It's good. And they cut down vast forests in order to have room to plant the crops. So pollen imagines the crops sitting there in their vast DNA spread going to the trees. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> we won. You're gone. We're here. All this sun, all this land, it's ours. He said flowers began to make flowers that would entrance whole cultures. Fruit trees began to make fruit. And they figured out that the sweeter the fruit, the more the humans would like the fruit, the more the humans would take the seeds in their pocket and spread their DNA all over the place. And so the sweetest fruit was the one that got to um, be spread far and wide. So Lockwood is aware that he is not at the center of the universe. It's such an important lesson. I saw a great bumper sticker that said, only one six billionth of this is about you. He said, I have made a choice that human lives and human ends are more important than grasshopper lives and grasshopper ends. But that is a decision I had to make. It's not a natural, obvious conclusion. He said, I'm always living in the tension between getting to know these creatures and knowing I have to kill them. And I want to be in an I-thou relationship with these creatures, where I think of them as beings that I could hold in my heart. He said, my four-year-old has trouble with pronouns, but the trouble makes him a, a poet of the spirit because he says, this is my blanket who I sleep with. This is the tree who I sit with. When I wanted to write that, my spell check did not want me to. <laughs> it kept saying, this is wrong, but it's not wrong. It's just another way of looking at it. Microsoft doesn't look at things that way. You have an I-thou relationship. Just practice. Today, tomorrow, as long as you, know, you, you, you can remember, just to, to say you to things. Hi, you, my car. Thank you, my car. Thank you, these trees. Thank you, flowers. Thank you, this food. Thank you, earth. Thank you, my clothes. Lockwood goes with his students into the field, and he prays. how to be more thoughtful and less destructive. He noticed these things about the grasshoppers while he and his students were videoing and watching. Number one, the grasshoppers traveled widely. They didn't stay in one little local area. They traveled widely. Number two, they are cannibals. When one of them died, the other ones ate it. So, okay, he's thinking, how do I use less of this pesticide? this neurotoxin. So he starts striping the grasslands with neurotoxin instead of just spraying it all over the place where it kills everything. Striping, narrow stripes. So the grasshoppers who travel will go across the stripes and get sick and die. And as they die, their buddies who haven't crossed the stripes yet will eat them and so they get the neurotoxin in them and they die. And the butterflies get to stay alive. And everything that's on this part that's not striped, that doesn't travel over the stripes. So you cut down a little bit, or a lot, on how much you use. He cut down on the pesticide he used 90%. That's significant. The other thing he did was he figured out how to use, instead of a neurotoxin that would kill other animals, he started using um, a growth inhibiting hormone. So it wouldn't work on all the insects. It just mostly worked on the grasshoppers. And so their exoskeleton didn't develop a hardness. It just kind of grew soft. So they didn't live very long. And when their buddies ate them, they didn't live very long. And so they're using 
very much of a less harmful pesticide, and they're using 90% less of it just because they slowed themselves down and observed and had an open mind to let go of their assumptions. So, as I said, he admits that he gives human purposes a higher priority than grasshopper purposes, and he says, you know, that's natural. Every species thinks probably that it's the most important one, but we mostly only know what we think. And he said, it's important to remember that the web of existence is predatory, that all the species kill and eat from the other species. Nature is like that. You have to kill in order to live. And he said, it's not smart to be too squeamish to be part of nature. You cannot not be part of nature. You can't think of yourself as the pure one that does everything perfectly without harming. You kill to, to eat, even if you're a vegetarian. So instead of thinking of yourself as pure or righteous, because as you know, self-righteous feelings are the root of all bad behavior, how about instead of feeling righteous or pure, we just feel alive? Life is muddy, but we do our best, and we live in the tension between loving and killing. May that tension be fruitful for us. May it make us humble, and may it make us good observers. Maybe so.